Good morning, everyone. And welcome to this session where we will discuss EdTech's promise in delivering improved student learning. COVID has challenged us all in a lot of different ways, but for EdTech, it's propelled an especially unique set of circumstances. For years, EdTech supporters have been working hard to get consumer mindshare, but now EdTech has been given a bigger role to play almost overnight. Today, I'm really looking forward to hearing from a very interesting panel, their reflections on what part of the EdTech promise were we able to deliver on over the last year and what needs to be done as we look ahead to the future. A warm welcome to all our panelists, each of whom is a disruptor in their own right and leading innovations that will shape what EdTech can do for India and hopefully globally. We have with us today, Jairaj Bhattacharya, who is the founder and CEO of Convergenius, Mansi Kasliwal, who is the VP of Social Initiatives at Baidu's, Nitin Kashyap, who is the Senior Product Manager at Read Along by Google, and Dr. Sahana Muthi, who is a professor at the EdTech Department, uh, the EdTech Interdisciplinary Program at IIT Bombay. I'm Rashi Dhanani, and a leader uh, portfolio of initiatives within the EdTech team at Central Square Foundation. Thank you for uh, joining us today. So, Professor Sahana, perhaps you can kick us off um, and set some context um, of the EdTech landscape. Let's begin with reflections on what is EdTech's role emerging to be um, in the post COVID world. And what are some of the critical um, issues in the edtech ecosystem um, that are still thorny? And what are some of the innovative idea that we ideas that we now need in play to continue to drive impact on student learning um, outcomes? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Rashi. Thanks for setting this up. So, like you mentioned, in uh, recent years, edtech uh, seems to offer a very strong potential, and rightly so for certain reasons. It fulfills certain needs in the educational uh, system and in, the, in, uh, in the current scenario and so on. And as a result, the demand and supply of edtech has surged definitely post COVID, but also in the last 10 years, you know, there were these large scale initiatives by the government of India, like the national mission in education through ICT, the traditional uh, academic publishing houses reoriented towards uh, technology division, producing content and so on. Now, the variety of edtech here is enormous. There are there exist different types of edtech in terms of the intended goals, the target audience, the technologies used, the pedagogical design, cost, use case, and along very uh, lots of parameters. Now, what happens in this variety are a few key challenges for multiple stakeholders in the ecosystem in the edtech ecosystem and. Uh, due to these challenges, there's a lot of difficulty in making adoption decisions. In uh, developing countries, one of the key problems here is that there are inadequate quality standards of what is good at tech. Why should I use it? For what purpose? Mm -hmm. Will it actually make a difference? And it doesn't. Uh, the other thing that happens is there are there's a lack of any unbiased reliable evaluations of the products out there. So as a result of this, especially in economic terms, this, there's a huge information asymmetry. And this leads to ad hoc, inefficient decision making uh, without much regard to the impact on student learning outcomes. So this is sort of setting up the big challenge we have today. Uh, yeah, Rashti, do you want me to go on or you want to? Yeah, would also love to hear a little bit more about you know, um, what are some of the ideas that we continue, continue to uh, con continuously need to focus on to continue to drive impact on student learning outcomes as we look at right. it, right? Right. So the requirement here is actually a set of quality standards, uh, which are rigorous, which are um, the standards have to come for decades of existing research and existing practice. At the same time, they have to be usable by all stakeholders in the ecosystem. For example, government decision makers, uh, schools, parents, uh, individual users, as well as the product companies themselves, uh, because these standards can also serve as formative feedback for the pro uh, product companies. So there's this huge need and this requirement for it. So along these lines, one of the initiatives that has, in fact, uh, begun for the past year and a half as a partnership between IIT Bombay and Central Square Foundation is called EdTech Tulna. And this, this, this exactly is the idea. Come up with a set of key quality standards based on uh, research, do unbiased, robust, 
quality evaluations of the products in the market, publish them, and help all the decision makers uh, use this to improve the overall quality. Yeah. Thank you, Vasana. And Nitin, turning over to you, right? Um, what are your thoughts on the need for increased evidence in the ecosystem over the last year or so? You know, what are a couple of things that have worked well um, since learning has shifted more online? Um, and what are the things that didn't work so well? And do you see a role for evidence um, becoming a little bit more prominent as we go ahead? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Rashi, again. And I'm happy to be part of this uh, discussion as well. Um, so I think to, to answer your part, your question is in two parts, right? And and what has worked well and, and what has not worked well. I think my overall reflection is it's sort of, uh, I, I, I can, I mean, you can think of it that we have survived the tsunami, right? Um, uh, but there is a lot of rebuilding to be done, right? Um, I think I think what EdTech did and, and, and more so also just the times that we were in with the penetration of mobile and all the other things. And when I say EdTech, I kind of mean including TV, radio, right? Use of education through any of those means, including even physical, right? Um, the innovation that are happening, they probably helped reduce some of the damage, right? If we didn't, we didn't get a severity 10 cyclone or whatever, right? We got a severity six, um, right? But we did no doubt have suffered a lot of damage, right? Um, but given in this scenario, I think from reflecting on what worked well, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is just people's resilience. Right, including teachers, students, parents, administrators, everybody. Right, like overnight when you have to come up with face with something like this, you have to come up with solutions. How do you put things together? Right, how do you board up your sort of uh, windows when the storm is approaching? And a lot of people did that. Right, I mean, especially in the first and second uh, waves, you know, teachers went to length to create to learn these new digital skills, create these videos, engage children. Right. And, and many of them put themselves in the line of harm as well, but still continue doing their duty. I think, I think that was the biggest thing that observation for me. And the second thing which you, which you hinted at, the, the increased mind share. So I believe it's no longer a question of if uh, technology can help in, in people's mind, in, in policymakers mind, in government's mind, in parents mind. Right. Um, but it's, it's the question shifted to how can technology really help? Right. Um, there are doubts and, and there are concerns that we have to address, right? But at least no, no, nobody's questioning, oh, I don't see a value for it. I can continue doing what I was doing. Everybody's talking about how can we make it better and how can this help, right? And the third broad thing that worked well is, is I think it, it at least accelerated the pace of innovation in this area by five years or so, right? And that happened everywhere, right? Including teachers and learning digital themselves. Uh, policymakers thinking about what is the framework through which we think we can have a tech. Like, I mean, you mentioned Dr. Zahana, uh, the Tulla initiative. I think the government came up like just recently with the whole national digital ed uh, education architecture, which in my mind is a wonderful framework and document for, for exactly addressing many of these concerns, right? So even in those uh, spheres, um, there was a lot of innovation around uh, how solutions were put up, and I'm, I will not steal Gerard's thunder on on how they managed to use WhatsApp and everything so effectively to just reach uh, so many um, people. Then, but even from a Google point of view, the the amount of investment that lots of companies are doing in now understanding these needs and and meeting these needs better, suddenly that that scale is completely different. Lots of startups have come up, which they would have never done. They found some problem here and opportunity, and therefore they have created things. Many of them will succeed, some will not, but there will be immense learning in the system, right? Um, so, so overall, those are like at the systemic level, those are things I think that have worked really well, right? And the children we could reach because of this, therefore definitely did not suffer as much as they would have if these things would not have happened. But what did not work well, clearly the biggest thing that comes to mind is equity, right? We have still failed a lot of our children, right? There are, there are a fair number of people who got access to it, children who had access at least to a device or to a TV, they could still get it. But there are a lot of children for whom, especially younger children, for whom education has been completely disrupted for a year, year and a half. And that learning loss is huge, um, right? So that that I think should be the, is has to be the number one focus overall for all of us to think to bridge first. And then comes the whole uh, 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 the focus on learning outcomes, and that's where I think the evidence fits in, right? Um, I don't blame the system. Like over the last year and a half, our focus has been completely on one way, right? Because 
at least let's get the education content out there and let's let's reach out to them right um and there have not been the frameworks as dr sahan is pointing out in terms of thinking about outcomes i mean if we are very fairly honest even in the non digital world the focus on outcomes was still a new thing that was coming in the education system right it's been a lot been on inputs um right how to focus on outcomes and how to track them there's a lot of academic research but no real implementation um sort of method and i actually see a silver lining there right maybe tracking outcomes you with the help of digital and edtech could become easier right than it could be without it otherwise for example for a simple thing like if you want to track how our children uh, reading in the offline world if you do not use technology right you have to uh, really find that much manpower to go and do these sample surveys and and do all of that right but can technology open to doors uh, doors to doing these things more innovatively right um so absolutely with you that the role of evidence is quite strong because that is what uh, sort of solidifies um people's engagement and makes it a long term thing that we do um and i truly believe technology can really help in in creating a bigger case for it thank you nitin jarad shifting gears to to kind of convergence's journey right nitin pointed out um that equity has been an issue and we all of course are aware of that right but what convergence has done over the last year uh, as you pivoted uh, to your covid response can you tell us a little bit more about that and how you're thinking about solving the issues of scale and distribution um especially for uh, bharat as you call it uh, thank you rashi um, so yeah convergence has had a specific mission aligned focus of providing edtech for the bottom 100 million so given that context uh, earlier our uh, model for edtech distribution was through schools and in school programs where there were a uh, device ict infrastructure so we were essentially reliant on ict and time school time and a certain period uh, associated to providing edtech dosage but covid happened and schools got shut so we had to get back to the drawing board and think you know how how else can we distribute and uh, how else can we provide um at the content to our uh, beneficiary which is the child at home where access to uh, devices from the parent is limited so that kind of led us to the to think you know how do we give one click experiences to make it as easy as possible for at the consumption and there were there were two things uh, two observations one was essentially google search is a one click experience and and then there is whatsapp uh, Uh, the internet for bharat is whatsapp on which everything is happening it's being shared people are uh, chatting in vernacular so uh, we essentially wanted to completely let go of you know all possible frictions um, like downloading an app getting to the otp registration process you know all that also required some kind of adoption uh, friction and it should be as simple as a click and you start learning so that's that's what kind of uh, pushed us to look at conversational ai and conversational experiences and so we took our essential science of learning back back stack which we were delivering through our application and we wrote a layer on on whatsapp and uh, we tried it out and um, uh, and the hypothesis did work and essentially um, parents uh, have access to whatsapp and they are okay to give their uh, mobile device for a certain period of time to their children um uh, and when the child likes it it creates a habit uh, so essentially it was a lot of uh, iterations in terms of what would be the right amount of time and what kind of experience um, can, that will elicit a kind of a habit change and also um, a retention in terms of the completion rates being consistent over a period of time on a week on week basis so uh, so that was kind of a key pivot that we had to kind of go through due to um, uh, covid and that led us to a uh, over overarching you know uh, category creation process where we were almost imagining that if we were to look at edtech for bharat as a homeschooling experience and you know build on top of existing platforms like uh, you know whatsapp google uh, youtube and you know build experiences build a adaptive learning layer on top of it you know we are not reinventing the wheel and we are also also encouraging the ecosystem of content creators uh you know teachers etc to build content and we'll parameterize it we'll we'll uh, link it to outcomes and uh, and a digital distribution layer gets created in this process and that could be a way for potentially the 197 odd smartphone devices across the 265 million students in india 
um, possibly in a sharing basis to kind of create a process of uh, ed tech equity. Thanks, Jairaj. Just a quick note to our audience. Um, please uh, do give in your questions either in the chat or in the Q&A section on the right. We will be picking up the questions towards the second half of this conversation. Um, thanks, Jairaj. So, Mansi, um, mm -hmm. would love to hear from you you know, um, what are some of the new product features or additions you see as of being of interest, right? As we focus on, uh, especially for younger learners, um, yeah. you know, with Nippon Bharat uh, coming into play in a larger way, um, as the focus on um, improving student learning outcomes um, increases, right? And both from right. education and ed tech, as that right. ask becomes larger. Right. Um, so I think it's very interesting to hear um, all of the points and perspectives um, that are coming from the other panelists. Now, in terms of uh, what are some of the features that uh, we are currently looking at, and especially for uh, younger learners that you've asked, I think the one uh, one thing that we are really strongly looking at is a more digital or experiential device experience for younger children to learn from. Because I think we can all agree that a purely online one way teaching system uh, for younger kids, it's, uh, you know, we cannot expect a very drastic learning outcomes to come out of that. And younger children, especially up to grade four, uh, need to experience uh, education, need to be able to write, pick up a pen paper and experience education in a manner where they can actually use their hands. Uh, so that a, a digital device, a device that the student can actually engage with is something that we've been uh, working on. Uh, and we do have a product right now out in the market. Um, that younger, younger students can learn from uh, where they can actually write and the device interacts with what the child has written uh, on a piece of paper or on a tablet and then gets reflected. So whether it is basic numeracy, whether it is literacy for younger kids, I think that is one way uh, that, uh, that, that's, that that has a lot of uh, you know room for innovation, uh, experiential online learning, even if it is happening in a remote manner. Um, and if we look at older kids again, right, uh, through our journey in the last one and a half year, both, uh, if, you know, when students, students from Bharat, as we are talking about uh, students uh, from the base of the pyramid, or whether we are talking of students who have been able to afford fairly good quality digital education, I think that the learning from both of those uh, grounds has been one that uh, vernacularization and contextualization of content are two critical elements in quick adoption and improving learning outcomes, right? So I think the one thing that we have done very quickly and continue to do is um, add languages, you know, add layers of contextualization so that students can actually start engaging in content that's more and more relevant to them. So whether it's through instructional design, whether it's through improving languages, whether it is through introducing teachers also to come in uh, and do part of that remote learning. I think those are some of the models that we are working on. In fact, uh, the, the the new thing that we've come up with recently is this idea of a dual teacher model where, uh, you know, one insight that we gained from the last year was that students are able to learn, they are able to stay engaged on a platform if the content quality is good. But while they're able to do that, uh, the measurement of the outcome or how multiple students are engaging on it, some of those elements are still being missed out because this is still a one-way stream of teaching. So even if you are doing synchronous classes, having two teachers in that synchronous mode makes complete sense, where one teacher is focused on the actual teaching and one teacher is focused on, let's say, doubt clearing, uh, engagement of the student. Uh, so, uh, you know, m multiple options in that. If it's synchronous learning, then the dual teacher model is something that we're very strongly looking at. Uh, if it's asynchronous model, then how do we add more layers of uh, data coming into our system so that we can actually start measuring learning outcomes at a deeper level. So because our product is a personally adaptive learning product where a lot of the inputs are anyway received, but during the pandemic, we've also gone offline. We've also created a module which is a completely offline model of our content so that students who don't have internet access but have a device can also learn. Now, in the offline model, we've, of course, come up with sort of blended models of measuring the outcome or you know getting data from ground on how the students are learning, what are the engagement times, what subjects are they learning better. So we've gained a lot of insights from many of those things. So I think going forward, uh, 
uh, at least from uh, our perspective, the focus is definitely going to be on improving uh, the learning efficacy uh, in synchronous models uh, and, uh, you know, coming up with more data parameters, coming up with better measuring techniques on the ground, whether it's an online model or an, I mean, whether it's online or offline content that's being delivered to the students. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Mansi. Nitin, um, would love to hear from you. You know, with the work that uh, is being done with Read Along or maybe uh, some of the other solutions, um, what can a blended learning model look like at scale for learning? Right, especially as you integrate closely with um, schools and governments, um, and you support uh, more deeply. What what do you really think the future of blended learning looks like um, using technology? Yeah, I think, um, and that one's a, it's an interesting question in the sense of, I mean, one, I feel personally that I think we the, the blended learning, what does it really mean is also sort yeah. of up for, I mean, it's become like a buzzword now, everyone, right? So I think that the answer kind of depend and could vary based on that and how people interpret it, right? I think what is clear is um, what, we will never be in the either extremes. We will never be in where we have gone completely back to the complete old world where everything is uh, physical and there is very little digital adoption. And there is never going to be a world where everything is digital, uh, right? And I'm speaking that being part of Google and sitting in a, in a technology company where we want to help. But I think even within uh, one of the core principles for our group, which focuses on learning and education with, within Google, is that uh, technology alone will never be enough to solve for education. But it would be a core enabler, uh, right? And and so, so when I think about, I think the, and I would, if I may broaden the sort of question a little bit to, where do I think really edtech can make a difference going forward, right? And and naturally the answer will be will look like a blended learning world, right? Um, but I think the key again the key dimensions on which I think technology has to make a difference is access first of all, right? It it has to be anywhere, anytime. It has to be across any device. You should be able to continue your journey if you if you have a happen to have a phone and that's all that you have you should be able to still continue your education versus if you can afford a laptop, right? For most of it, we should be able to make sure that we can deliver similar experiences and similar impact on the children who are using it from an access point, uh, device point of view, an internet point of view, right? There's a lot of role of ed tech companies and us to make sure that we can create those experiences. We don't create experiences which only work for a particular device or always rely that there have to be an internet connection and fine kind of things like that. Then really the, the, the next four dimensions in my mind are all just how do you even break down this whole learning uh, ecosystem in that sense. And the core actions for me are teaching, um, learning, assessing, and monitoring, right? Um, and then each of these, uh, the way I see uh, thing, things, technology has already pushed, started that sort of nudge, and it, will, it should broaden up. In teaching, teachers are much more digitally literate. Teachers want to create YouTube videos of their own or slides of their own or whatever that is, right? Which earlier they would not have done. They see the value that if they do it once, they can now use it again and again. They can share and collaborate with other teachers themselves, right? So a lot of those ways of working which were sort of embedded have changed, right? And then teachers getting and the tools that help teachers to create those materials better, for example, right? Um, so, so a lot can be done in, in uh, teaching. The, the other thing that if we in the future can also happen with technology is um, as the monitoring and assessing happens, technology tools can actually help teachers differentiate, identify groups of children who need a particular type of help and, a, and help on a particular learning outcome who are falling behind and how could you help them, right? So a lot of, lot of scope for technology to help in, enhance teaching uh, in that sense, right? Um, Learning for individual children. Similarly, I mean, I think personalized learning is is now uh, fairly is not a sort of novel concept, right? It's it's a concept that many companies have sort of uh, got deep expertise in. Um, they have mapped the learning outcomes. They have created the skill maps, and they can see how children are traversing it, right? Um, it's not something as alien, right? And this can only help improve the experience for a child. How can you help the child in the moment when they are struggling with something? And then, but how can you also help remedy the the uh, the basic skill underlying it? Like, so my product read along. Our mission is universal literacy, and for helping children learn to read, um, even when they are offline, using voice, right? So, which is which makes it two way because a child reads and they get real real time feedback, right? And it kind of takes away the need of somebody being present for you, right? So, from a learning point of view, again, lots of scope for 
you can continue do your bulk of your learning and interaction and one on one and pair and teacher child interaction in the in the class but then come back and practice anything at home and pick up from where you left right um assessing i i kind of already mentioned uh with the with again the uh, learning outcomes uh and and tracking comprehension i think in the core element uh, to build on what dr sahana was saying earlier was the the evaluation of tools is one but the ndr framework if i go back to it again right is a very comprehensive view um of how do you take content and how do you really unbundle it and define attributes to it so that you can really create a common taxonomy of these are the learning outcomes level by level grade by grade subject by subject right and if there is a common terminology around that then suddenly the ecosystem can contribute content creators can create it search can find it PayPal uh, uh, companies can create experiences which give the right suggestion and help the child navigate uh, the thing. So that for me is another basic foundational element of getting a common structure of learning outcomes and uh, and taxonomy created, right? And then finally is monitoring, which I mean again, if you look given the diversity of that we have in India, the scale that we have in India, we know the reality on the ground, the amount of time the teachers spend in doing things that is that is administrative, right? um and there again there is a huge potential for uh, technology to come in um and and take away a lot of mundane tasks right if you are taking a class line online you can you should have your attendance already created you don't have to then go and spend things or if you are grading things and assessment is happening um then the report card should already be prepared and you don't have to spend time writing those things and transferring it and creating those reports a lot of those tasks should be the burden should be taken away uh, from from those teachers right so i think the way i look at it blended learning the question for me is as technology comes more and more into and works together with the people in the ecosystem what all avenues can it open um very interesting i am also um, excited by the potential of endo to kind of energize the ecosystem again um and look forward to all the innovation that will come from it um another question for you nitin from the audience while i have you all take this up um uh, it's a question from kinari how mm -hmm. challenging is it to design educational products for emerging mm -hmm. users and for mm -hmm. children across different age groups mm -hmm. Yeah, great question, Kinari. And then the short answer is very difficult. I'm sure Mansi and Jairaj would also uh, also agree there. I mean, I think, but but that's the that's also the challenge and thrill of it. But that's all. There's also a method in the madness, um, right? And that's where you rely on. I mean, I think the the fundamental of really understanding what is the user problem, what comes in the way, um, then understanding your user in terms of how do they engage with some uh, with 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 any solution that you are proposing. and continuously monitoring it and iterating it um, comes into the picture right uh, so to uh, and i mean education is such a vast subject and the answer changes from um, even for the same problem let's like say for example learning to read the needs of a grade 1 child are very different they want more phonetic awareness and association with sounds versus a grade 2 or grade 3 child right where it is more about decoding and fluency a grade 4 wants comprehension a grade 5 now wants to do silent reading right and and and, and you have to kind of think about how will you meet the needs and you can't meet the needs of all also given it's always a resource constrained problem we don't have infinite resources so you have to start somewhere where the most of the meaty problem is solve that and then gradually uh, gradually build on it right um yeah thanks sir and oman sir jara if you want to add anything yeah. there no i think you rightly pointed out that the needs at each stage are different and therefore a uh, one size fits all solution is not really going to be a solution so you you pick the lowest hang hanging fruits with the maximum potential impact uh, you start with that um, and then start building on layers uh, start yeah. building in personalization at every yeah. level so that you know all students needs yeah. are met in that sense so yes the short answer is it's not easy uh, a lot of resources are needed a lot of uh in depth you know understanding a lot of uh, pedagogical research and structural designers so you know, there's there's a lot that needs to come together to really build a learning products for children of all ages uh, but um, but yeah that's that's the exciting part and that's the thrill that uh, those are the problems that uh, we're trying to solve every day so So, <clears throat> the it matters a little bit more here is that it uh, like uh, Nitin and Mansi correctly pointed out it's uh, the needs in terms of what exactly the learners need to do at different levels are different of course but it's also how 
different students learn at different levels you know there is a mansi kind of alluded to it so again there is a, there is a lot of uh, research in the learning sciences and psychology and all so there are some common ideas that help the student help the learner make sense of the material now how a second grader makes sense and how a ninth grader makes sense may be different and somehow that needs to be either built into the product or the teacher can do certain things i think we'll come to yes. that discussion in some time uh, at the same or another example is we need to make sure that every you know the children are uh, intrinsically motivated and engaged and by engaged i don't mean the aesthetics or just the attractiveness but are they cognitively engaged in the material and how to do it at uh, different levels of understanding different grade levels are different so this is definitely a tall order i'm kind of sitting slightly on the other side than the three of you uh, but i am on the same side actually helping with the design so it's it's really hard but there are there are these common principles and the way they're operationalized might be different at the different levels yeah to add on to that uh, sahana i think you know we can take an analogy to the whole concept of science of telemedicine right the whole aspect of medicine earlier uh, was a very complicated subject in general yeah. in terms yeah. of how do we diagnose diagnose what what is the problem and give a cure and give medicines but there was a diagnosis science built over a period from 1920s to now similarly uh, learning is is a science that is being unraveled uh, and i think the core to that is measurement of how essentially can we measure competencies sub competencies on the cognitive layer and potentially a, a bit later on the non cognitive layer as well uh, so i i essentially you know we have had this discussion earlier with nitin that we we are imagining uh, learning also as a gps map if you were to able to find the child's current location which is where where they are today in a particular subject and where they need to be which is uh, your grade level competency you can create journeys uh, learning journeys which are different for every child um, and these are based on both uh, the style of learning preferences as well as the learning pace in in terms of how fast the child learns so uh, so i think measurement is key how do we essentially uh, measure and diagnose and i'll just throw one in the works on that point right um when we speak about measurement and when we speak about engagement how close are we today to actually being able to tie this to student learning outcomes right um are we in the edtech world able to kind of make that connection and then map and move children along that parameter or do we still have a fair amount of work to do together for anyone and i can go in from a read along point of view i think the answer i mean i, I don't think we are uh, close to whatever whatever right? I mean, again given the spectrum so much right the answer would be very different from a, for what competency you are talking yeah. about is it a science student in grade 10 i think the general framework is what jairaj uh, sort of articulated like right? if you abstract it out completely it's about creating the learning map creating where you are where you want to be and how much distance can some intervention help you travel right uh, but to make it more concretely it's it's, it's maybe it's a little bit more tangible and easy to understand when you're talking about learning to read right because there at least for and, and again i would focus down to grade 2 3 4 for example right and and if you again go about, either go to nepal bharat or even india there there at least and there's a lot of academic research which is a, a, a easy to understand but also important and reasonably strong metric is oral reading fluency right um at what speed is a child reading and at by grade what what speed they should be able to read with comprehension right um so that something is something that is that can be very very concretely defined and measured even with technology right and that for one is the metric that we use internally for read along right we have 3 million or 30 lakh children every month reading uh, and spending 10 15 minutes day on day reading on the app because and because the app is not just them watching videos or them watching videos where the color is changing of the what text is being seen they can do a lot of that kind of stuff as well to listen to the app but they have to speak into the app right so the app can continuously listen to them and therefore we have a very very strong simple signal of what is their reading speed and how does it increase once a child spends 100 200 300 minutes in the app and we can actually see that right so that's an example of a, a well defined learning metric that renders itself well to to being measured and therefore can be used uh, as an example right not everything would be that simple but i think that's the sort of general journey we would have to go through like let's define the metric it should be easy and and predictive right and and sort of credible and once that is there uh, how do you make it measurable right 
uh, and we will have to do it over and over again for all the uh, different competencies uh, involved. Yeah, I think Nitin said this very well. That uh, the key po takeaway point here is the specific specificity and you know the def defining what exactly you're looking for. So, Rashi, to go back to your question, you know, you, you we we making a connection between something as big and gross as engagement uh, and technology, another bucket, and then student learning outcomes. These are all very big and complex, and it, it's not at all easy, and it's also not. I think the the right way to go about it because there's a lot of nuance in each of these three buckets and there's also a lot of myths and perceptions that look technology can come and solve all our educational problems today which i mean none of the speakers have said that uh, of course and what each of us is trying to do is to unpack these three uh, three or four different complex buckets now in the last half an hour, we have talked about access issues. We've talked about engagement. We've talked about learning. We've talked about engage, uh, engagement is done. We've talked about a little bit about the efficiency. These are all different intended goals or purposes. So when some selection of edtech is being made or by, by a school or by a parent, uh, I, I, they, it, it has to be a little clear as to what exactly we are looking for in the product. You know, do I want the product to engage my children for a while? Or do I want them to improve their oral skills? So this is on the selection side, but it's much more important on the design side that uh, do I want to create a product for the bottom 100 million users, like uh, Gerard said, where a lot of the focus is on access and good content, or do I want the 10 standard science student to be able to learn uh, variable manipulations, where you have to maybe go with a little more uh, involved uh, simulations. And why this is important is Unfortunately, a single solution cannot address all of these equally well. I mean, this may this is not happy news. It may be even provocative, but we can't have a one size fits all. So being very clear about why we are designing it and why we want to use a tech, I think that that's that distinction is important to make when we start doing the measurement. And um, what <clears throat> you know, as we speak about um, kind of this measurement and thinking about designing products using data, what are some of the thoughts on, since I think all initiatives here would have gotten a lot more data over the last year than they have previously, right? How is this data being used to develop both products and programs um, in a more meaningful manner as we look ahead, right? Whether that's towards hyper-personalization, whether that's towards any of your other goals, what role is data playing today and will continue to play as we look at So maybe I can I can start with that, Rashi. Uh, so yes, uh, you know, in the last one and a half year, uh, we as a company have seen almost 200% growth in terms of users. Um, you know, there are 100 million users uh, who have in some ways at some point in time engaged with the Baiju's content. And of course, the basic data that is being collected right now is what is the time, average time that is being spent by a child on the app? Uh, which section is that time being spent on? Is it science? Is it mathematics? Is it, you know, a certain chapter in science? Um, uh, you know, uh, the assessments, quizzes that the children are taking on that. Are they taking a, a particular test repeatedly? Are they moving ahead? Are they skipping chapters? So all of that data is what is available for us to draw insights from. And currently, the way that we are using this data is, of course, number one, you know, based on how students are engaging with different content, a constant improvement on how that content is delivered. Uh, if it's certain videos that are being skipped uh, continuously by students, then, of course, a revision on how that particular piece of content is being delivered to the students. If students are uh, not performing very well uh, on a particular test, then are we delivering that test? So it's that the emphasis is on constantly improving how we are delivering the content, how we are testing the students, how we are making. So for us, I think that, like Dr. Sahana uh, you know, pointed out, what is the objective here? Our primary objective has, of course, been number one, getting students engaged so that learning continuity is maintained, especially during the pandemic, such that the students have content that they can learn from. Our focus has been on science and math, and therefore, you know, science, of math, science and math have always been subjects that are considered, you know, difficult to learn and students, you know, wrote learning involved and all of that. So the idea has been to take away uh, that concept of rote learning and make learning fun, uh, which is where the engaging content comes into play. 
so keeping and then of course the, the the basic objective or i think the big mission is to achieve learning outcomes by number one involving and engaging students more number two breaking down the content and concepts into very simple and easy to digest um, you know modules so that children can very easily understand some of the more difficult concepts and there, there's no rote learning involved so now with all of those the idea is that there should be learning outcomes there should be improvement in how children are uh, number one, not being fearful of those subjects. And number two, because now they're not being fearful, they are able to learn better. Uh, so, you know, that is how a lot of the data that we are using uh, is constantly being used to improve, number one, our own content. Number two, also come up with new products. Uh, so one is the content side of things. And the other is, like I mentioned, you know, from the synchronous classes that we were running, we realized that there is more to be done there and perhaps having two teachers in a room would help in the learning because now there's more than just delivering that content that the, that the students need and therefore there is improvement in what we are now delivering to the students uh, even on the uh, side where we are working uh, with children in remote areas uh, uh, you know many the data that has been collected is again being used to prioritize what we work on because you know like everyone's pointing out to this that there, it, it's a huge problem there is just so many layers to work on how do you prioritize which ones to pick which are the battles to pick up right now and fight better so i think how we are using the data is you know uh, ensuring that we are we are coming up with better content better products that are actually uh, responding to uh, students needs that are filling the gaps that we uh, that the students uh, feel in their learning the parents feel the teachers feel in how they are able to teach so a lot of the new features that are built are also addressing teachers whether it is teacher training for digital education whether it is providing teacher notes in fact that's been our effort with google with the google uh, you know classroom suite that is now being bundled up with the byju's content because the idea there is that you know as we go into the blended model how do you also address this problem for schools and not just students who have now been learning digitally there has to be a marriage of both where both of these primary stakeholders of the education system can come together and come on a common platform so that you know learning can be made easier um, so and, and at the ground level uh, you know where children don't have uh, you know complete access digital access the effort is to uh, perhaps come up you know with insight so that we can we can we can bring in new products bring in bridge programs for grade level competency uh for better literacy and numeracy uh so yes i think it's it's the way we are using data is primarily as a feedback to improve to to bring in constant improvement uh in in whatever uh, we are doing Gerald, do you want to add something from the way you, I think you also use from actual giving feedback to teachers as well, right? From the, from your channel. Yeah. So, um, uh, Convigenius essentially believes, believes in the whole model of nudge, right? Uh, so, uh, we look at data as, uh, the input to the various nudges that we can potentially provide to the ecosystem. Um, now when we look at the ecosystem, uh, the primary, uh, uh, stakeholders, as Mansi said, is the student and the teacher. In our segment, in the bottom 100 million, it is also the parent because actually uh, it's the parent's device on which uh, the parent actually is being nudged to give the child access to the device. It's not not really. The device. So uh, so it's actually a, a choice architecture problem in terms of, you know, we have data, both engagement, outcomes data, um, attendance data. We have a lot more data, actually. Uh, we, we, we are also correlating that data uh, with other data points, like uh, uh, for a particular district, you know, what are the teacher qualifications of that school where we are getting good responses in terms of outcomes? Or, you know, um, what uh, what kind of infrastructure facilities of the UDIs um, is kind of providing, provided in that school? And that that big, big data trend allows us to also imagine, you know, how our learning outcome data points is correlated to the ecosystem and how do we nudge the ecosystem in general, which are the secondary players in the ecosystem, which is like the BRCs, the CRCs, the government machinery. Um, how do we create uh, design nudges for the other people who are important machineries in the ecosystem? So I think uh, data is the key layer and I, with the whole aspect of ed tech and the ability to generate data from the last mile from the beneficiary it's it's a it, it's like a it's a huge value that we are creating not just for the parent and the teacher but also overall for an ecosystem level uh, and in the ecosystem we also include our content partners 
uh, there's a lot of content players putting up content on YouTube um, for free, and they would want to know analytics about you know whether their content is working or not. Um, for for a given segment of say a million users, uh, if we were to give two content players equal access, um, and one content player's content is working well, um, that that data itself tells us you know a lot about uh, why content A is working better than content B. So uh, then there is a nudge given to the content player as well. You know, you may you may want to you know tweak yeah. this part. So so essentially, data help is helping both uh, nudges from a perspective of product, from a perspective of programs, and also uh, behavioral nudges. We call it behavioral, right? I think someone Smitha had brought it up, right? Um, how do we behaviorally nudge the child or the parent uh, to kind of just nudge them? To, you know, maybe. Uh, uh, focus on fractions a bit more uh, so uh, so data is very critical for that and uh, the systems that that we have today allow us to kind of find these patterns automatically the the ai and ml algorithms have evolved so much that we don't really need to rebuild those they they just give us insights based on the big data that we are generating and we just have to build a layer on top of it to essentially uh, uh, nudge the the stakeholders in the system yeah. Yeah. can I spend a couple of minutes on teachers since the discussion of teachers has come up in this discussion and I was also looking at the Q&A. There are several questions related to teachers. Sure, Professor. So, um, see, uh, two key, when it comes to edtech, the teachers have at least two functions. One is selection. How do I know which is the big one? There's so many in the market. Sometimes product companies come. Sometimes I just hear from everybody. So how do I select for my goal? And the second is how do I use it more effectively? So when it comes to selection, uh, rightly so, teachers really want to use something which is good, which is strong from a pedagogical perspective, which will help their students learn. And this, this point really has to be emphasized because there, there are these perceptions that, oh, edtech is fancy videos, edtech can, uh, uh, is about uh, you know, fancy technology and all. It may involve those, but the core of the edtech, what the core should do is actually be strong in the pedagogical design and help the student be engaged and help the student learn. So along these lines, the Tulna initiative that I talked about in the beginning, we are having the launch of this initiative in a month or so, in a month, month and a half. So uh, request all of you to do, please join, see how the different products are uh, performing, see what the large scale adopters are saying about it. So there is some guidance now being built for teachers and users and adopters on how to select based based on what is important for them. When it comes to the use, uh, there is a phrase in educational research called effective integration of edtech. And integration means starting from the pedagogical purpose and using it more effectively. So of course, it's not a one-way learning like Mansi mentioned earlier. The emphasis that the, one of the good things that the pandemic has done uh, is uh, because now technology is sort of there everywhere teachers are asking how do i use it and what the uh, teacher professional development uh, tr um, uh, tr uh, groups are doing is bringing in the ideas of learner centric uh, approaches active learning giving the learner more control over what to be done having teachers design activities around the technology so this was there 50 years ago it was there 100 years ago but because of the technology it's kind of it's become easier now to you know nudge teachers saying design some active learning strategy in your class using the edtech because the student will learn better the technology will also <laughs> perform its function so in some sense you know we are taking the old strong ideas which uh which didn't really which which weren't being used as much and and the lecture method and all was being used a lot more but because now the technology is there and the teacher is not very sure of what to do uh this, strong ideas, the research-based ideas of active learning and learner-centric approaches are being uh, reused using the technology. And I think that's one of the good things that the edtech has done for the ecosystem. To add to that, San, I just um, wanted to bring up one point, though. Uh, while Tulana is benchmarking, uh, there is also initiatives uh, in terms of collaborating with regard to data that is also happening. Like, for example, Bharat EdTech Initiative is just launched where Vedantu Topper um, uh, MindSpark and Convigineers are working together to kind of build together an interoperable architecture uh, where uh, their edtech data, our edtech data, we kind of create something together, right? I think there is enough data now post the pandemic where we can build that, uh, where uh, we have common a common language and a common framework. 
So yeah. uh, you should you should align that yeah. to NDR, Jiraj. I mean, because that, I mean, I, I wanted to bring in that point. It sounds like I'm sort of supporting NDR at all, but but <laughs> but if you look at it, I mean, the open data pillar is is a is a critical pillar. Open data and analytics for of it, right? And and so yeah, I, mean, I think uh, I think we are all sort of vehemently agreeing and landing on the same thing that these are some common building blocks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, getting open, getting standards, getting reference implementations, getting evaluation methodologies, getting learning outcomes clearly defined, having data that can be shared. So I think the data I and mean, Google is a company based off data, right? So in that sense, but I, the two things I would just want to add, I think what both of you said, data is definitely used for improving the product, improving the user experiences. There is a huge potential for data in this space to help improve the just design the system better. And somebody again on the Q&A said, look, India's education system has evolved since last 75 years. I would say even before, right? We are still in the pre-industrial era education system that we that we were given with. And yes, I, we are not in an illusion that EdTech will suddenly make things better in a year or two, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think this, is, this in my mind is a 10 to 15 year journey at least minimum, right? But I'm also hopeful, like, I mean, it's like, imagine what the iPhone was when it came back in 2008, right? And if you were given that phone right now, you'd say, what? This is what Apple made? Uh, right, and and given what it is right now, so we are at that stage, even pre that stage in yeah. tech, right? Yeah. But there is clearly a, a, a great sort of blueprint in front of us, right? And it is for us to lose the opportunity to not act on it. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, no, thanks, Nathan. I think those are some very uh, interesting reflections as we kind of come to a close to the session, right? Maybe I'll just share one of the questions that was shared by Abhishek Nair, just as uh, closing comments as opposed to a question at the stage. Um, but, you know, he's just saying that different edtech solutions are targeting and developing insights for different aspects of student learning, right? And it will be very interesting to see how the edtech ecosystem collaborates internally and externally to create holistic uh, solutions for the student and the teacher, right? And I think on that note, Thank you all uh, so much for this wonderful conversation and for joining uh, from the audience. Thank you to Charcha uh, Najin Central Square Foundation for uh, setting up today's event. Um, quickly, uh, please stay on um, as a plug for the next session. Um, the next session is on making edtech accessible at scale and how to bridge the digital divide. Um, please do join and hear from an interesting set of panelists from Dalberg, Pratham, Kaid, Samagra, and Central Square Foundation. Thank you again, um, all of you, for joining us today. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.